right, so hello to uh, the TAG runtime meeting. Uh, today is June 15th, 2023. And um, uh, yeah, we can just get started, just notice that this meeting under CNCF uh, Code of Conduct, so which means please be nice to each other, be kind to each other. Um, and uh, in our agenda today, uh, we have two projects uh, to, to present, the Cube Clipper and Wasm Cloud. We are so excited to have you here. And uh, I think uh, we can get started directly with Cube Clipper. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's let me share my screen. Cuba yeah. Clipper. Yeah. Uh, I'm very glad to introduce your guys about our project, Cuba Clipper. Mm, okay. Uh, uh, you can. Uh, just visit uh, clipper.io by yourself. And let's see the uh, overview of our projects. What is Kuba Clipper? Um, Kuba Clipper is a lightweight web service that provides friendly web console, GUI APIs, and client tool for Kubernetes cluster lifecycle management. And Kuba Clipper provides a flexible CAS, which allows users to rapidly deploy Kubernetes clusters anywhere. That means clouds, hypervisor, bare metal, and provides persistent, persistently lifecycle management capabilities, uh, installation, deleting, upgrading, uh, and et, et cetera. Uh, our project goal is to manage Kubernetes in the most lightest and convenient way. Uh, okay. That's a brief uh, introduce about uh, why people want Kubernetes. Clipper. Uh, under the premise of being fully compatible with native Kubernetes, uh, KC is repackaged based on the Kube admin tool widely used by the community, providing rapid deployment of Kubernetes clusters and uh, for like, uh, life cycle management um, in the uh, enterprise on infra infrastructure. It supports multiple deployment methods such as online, proxy, and offline, and also provides rich and scalable management service for CRI, CNI, CSI, and various CRD components. Okay, let's look at, uh, take a look at the architecture. Uh, Kuba Clipper uh, is uh, uh, core components has three parts. Uh, the first one, KC agent. Uh, this is which deploy on the management node, communicate with KC server, this part through the message queue and it takes responsible for reporting node information processing and executing tasks. It is a Kuber, uh, it is a Kuber Kuber node proxy tool. Uh, this part, uh, KC server, Kuber Clipper server, is uh, collecting informations reported by KC agent, uh, distributing front end operations to design it, uh, KC agents and summarizing execution results, et cetera which is the core of which control of Cobra Clipper and also the database ETCD. And we also have a command line tool, uh, KCCTL. Uh, next part is the topology. Mm. It's, uh, it's a web console and term, uh, command line tool. Uh, connect uh, to the ETCD cluster to the Kuba Clipper server, and uh, we can uh, create uh, Kubernetes clusters with node installed with Kuba Clipper agent, 
in uh, a region. Okay. Uh, any questions from here? I think uh, you can show the um, roadmap from the GitHub uh, um, web page. GitHub page. Um, I sent it in the uh, chat, po uh, chat board, GitHub. Uh, GitHub slash kubeclipper, kubeclipper. Uh, you can find the link from the chat window. Yeah, yeah, here, yeah. okay. Yeah, which part? Yeah, the features and uh, the the map. Ah, right. Features and map here, and then next part is uh, talking about the features. Uh, now our project Kubeclipper support deployment of Kubernetes on any infrastructure and provide comprehensive cluster lifecycle management. Uh, that means cluster recreation, deletion, backup, uh, and et cetera. Uh, Kubeclipper supports multiple deployment modes. Uh, that means online offline deployment support and also multi uh, architecture and cluster import. Mm, I mean, uh, we can import uh, non kubeclipper created uh, clusters. Mm, node and node management. Uh, uh, kubeclipper can automatic uh, uh, registry registry node automatically and collect, uh, collect uh, node information and there, also there, there's a question from from David. Sorry to interrupt, uh, David. Okay, the question. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Uh, can you compare and contrast uh, Kube Clipper and uh, say Cluster API? Uh, they seem very similar uh, in their goals, and I'm curious uh, where the where the differentiation comes in. Let. Uh, I'll ask my uh, the main developer. Yeah, uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, indeed. Uh, so I was curious what the differentiation is between uh, Cluster API and Kube uh, uh, Clipper. Um, they seem like they're approaching uh, a similar problem space: uh, cluster lifecycle management. Um, and using uh, Kube ADM underneath the covers to, to achieve its goals. And I'm curious uh, where the differentiation in the projects comes from. So you mean, uh, uh, you, mean you find uh, another project uh, which is similar to uh, Kube Clipper and uh, you want to find the difference between uh, each other, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll throw a link in uh, for cluster API. I, I imagine, I, yeah, COPS uh, is also a, a good one. Okay. So there's, okay. There's, okay. Quite okay. A, there's quite a few uh, in this space, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, cluster API is, uh, um, it's just, it's, uh, okay. We can, we can, I think uh, we can show you uh, the management uh, from the uh, Cube Clipper. Uh, okay, uh, wait uh, one minute. Uh, Xiao Wei, do we have a uh, do we have a, a, a demo uh, environment yeah, sure, uh, to show? Yes, we can show it uh, um, them under these questions. Do we have a website to show this? Uh, 
how to create and how to do this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Cube Clipper can create uh, uh, the cluster uh, in uh, from the API or uh, command line or web console, uh, and uh, uh, you can you can go to the uh, you can go to the uh, experience like uh, the uh, cloud, maybe AWS or Azure, uh, just like uh, them to create a, quickly create a, a cluster. And uh, the um, it's based on the uh, Kube admin. We um, we try to uh, give Kube admin uh, um, an API. And uh, uh, difference to you uh, you point uh, the cluster API. Cluster API is uh, only uh, API uh, to implement by the. Uh, K uh, Kubernetes in Docker, right? In kind, kind mode, K uh, K in B, kind mode, and uh, we do uh, do not uh, uh, like this. We just uh, um, based on Kubernetes and give it uh, API. You can uh, you can treat it as Kubernetes with API. Uh, with API, it can do a lot of things uh, from the from the um, cluster cluster creating page, uh, you can to choose a lot of uh, uh, configuration and uh, um, quickly create uh, the the cluster. Okay, I don't I don't think uh, I don't know if I answer the question. I think you did uh, at least reasonably. I, I appreciate it. Uh, the, so it looks like it's a uh, a thin. Uh, a, a nice UI layer over top of Kube ADM to, to help you create clusters. Does that sound accurate? So, yeah, so I think, oh. uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the UI and uh, I'm not sure if the cluster API based on Kube ADM or not, but uh, I think this uh, this is another Factor that Q uh, Clipper just not, uh, mentioned now. Yeah, so I'm uh, so not sure if it uses it uses those components, but uh, it sounds like they also have some uh, an agent and a server, and they you may also have uh, CRDs or because I know Cluster API has its own CRDs and and accomplishes uh, what we're seeing here, uh, but it doesn't have a user interface and, and, and this provides a user interface um, maybe on top of other things in the back end. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, uh, I didn't catch you. Uh, so I asked my, uh, my, uh, my parents, uh, my, uh, ask my coworker to translation it. Uh, Got him in the fine issue. Um, about which question? Oh, so, so the initial question was uh, how how is this project different from cluster API? So that have you heard of the cluster API project? Uh, I will translate for I will translate. Uh, cluster API can take a Kuba Clipper to Chibi. Okay, okay, okay. We uh, write codes like uh, CRD. Uh, however, we didn't uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, just didn't implement it as uh, uh, cluster API because uh, we think uh, uh, we can uh, move the Kube Clipper agents and the server um, before uh, move it uh, under or um, under or beside. Uh, uh, the KBS cluster, 
uh, before create uh, the first uh, KBX cluster, you can uh, you can run KC server and uh, KC agent uh, uh, um, separately. Uh, do not uh, uh, depend on um, KBS cluster. Uh, uh, by this, uh, so you can run it uh, very quickly just with the system D uh, daemon. Uh, do not use to. Firstly, you can you you have to create a KBS uh, cluster first. Uh, then run the uh, Kube Clipper own cluster. Then uh, do the next next things. However, in our roadmap, you can trans to the trans to the roadmap page. Got here. Change to the roadmap page. Change to the roadmap page. Okay. And uh, uh, the first the first line uh, the first line. Uh, we suppose uh, maybe next one we can use uh, image to. Uh, with uh, user image, can, the, with the image we can run uh, based on the KBS and uh, uh, K uh, Kubernetes, and uh, we can also um, decode it and uh, uh, run it uh, by uh, with the binary mode uh, without uh, KBS cluster. So uh, for this, uh, for this thing, maybe after we finish this, we can. Uh, just like a, a standard CRD mode, okay. And I, need to, and I need, need to explain what he says. K bias is Kubernetes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alex, you have a question. Hi, thank you. Yes. Um, so how do you handle the provisioning of uh, nodes? Uh, for example, um, with uh, different um, similar tools such as Cluster API and COPS, uh, you have the ability to define through different infrastructure service providers, um, AWS, um, et cetera, uh, the ability to connect through their API and then provision a particular node. Um, these are typically uh, virtual machines, uh, but they can also be bare metal machines, depending on your requirements. How does Kube Clipper provision uh, nodes? You said kind. Does that mean, uh, or KIND, uh, does that mean that um, Kube Clipper is a single tenant um, and that you would have to run different tenants with Kube Clipper installed manually? Uh, how, does, how does the provisioning of nodes work? Uh, okay, uh, let's uh, uh, let's talk about your questions and uh, to make sure you uh, we catch you. Uh, Gao Tingyue,就是你尝试说一下这个他说的东西是什么？他是不是说那个我们需要用这个就是底层是不同的，然后我们如何用KCAgent去去去去打通所有的底层，是这样吗？嗯。Uh, sorry, I uh, probably need you to repeat your uh, repeat your questions. Excuse me. Handle the provisioning of uh, nodes. Can, for example, we provision nodes on different infrastructure as a service providers, such as AWS as EC2 instances, similar to how cluster API and COPS have integrations with these infrastructure as a service providers. Oh, sorry. Uh, we still couldn't uh, catch you exactly. Uh, could you type it in the uh, chat window uh, in simple way? Uh, I catch you no uh, some, some word, but yep. I couldn't uh, catch you every word. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, please. Uh, if, if we can uh, just, uh, you know, like put our uh, questions in the chat and we will make sure to gather them, um, making them all answered in the, even here in, in the meeting or uh, in, in our Slack channel after that. Thank you. And time check, we have 10 minutes. Okay. 
Yeah, you can you okay, can go ahead. I see yes. you. Uh, how does Clipper handle prevention of uh, uh, nose uh, like usually? Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, do you mean you want to know uh, how Clipper uh, could uh, handle all the uh, the provision from maybe VM spare metals? How could the uh, Clipper to uh, touch them or uh, manage them, management them? Can I use? Okay, sure, you can. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah you can. How, you how can, does yeah. this work? Uh, how does it work? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you uh, if you uh, have tried uh, this one Auto K three S. Do you find this? Have you tested uh, this this tools? I know Auto K three S. Yes, but this yeah. is a okay. this is a particular version or distribution of Kubernetes. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 and. Uh, uh, you can say uh, you can you can take uh, uh, auto K uh, three as as uh, uh, web uh, UI and uh, API uh, and K K three as K three yeah and uh, uh, K C like uh, uh, web UI and uh, API and uh, K Kubernetes uh, like this. And uh, uh, how how we could uh, management uh, the nodes? Uh, we just uh, use uh, the credential, use the VM's credential uh, to uh, S SSH uh, remote uh, access to the node and uh, uh, push push put the uh, cube clipper agent uh, in the uh, nodes. Uh, Either it's it's a VM or it's a bare metal or uh, 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 on cloud uh, on cloud uh, nodes uh, both okay. It's just run the KC agents. We uh, with the agents, uh, all the agents uh, will uh, find uh, find uh, the KC server by the configuration by, by its configuration and it sent. Uh, a message to KC server uh, with the with the message queue with the message queue. So uh, we can we can collect all the nodes uh, information and send a send a message by the message queue uh, to to them. Uh, so the KC agent is uh, uh, is uh, single directional. Yeah. Uh, on, uh, we just uh, we just uh, requires the node uh, the the network from the uh, agent to the server uh, is okay. Do not uh, require that the server uh, send a message to agent directly. Okay. I don't know. I, I if I answer your questions. <laughs> Uh, you did. Um, it sounds like that you do not use CRDs to provision um, VMs and that you use SSH and an auxiliary tool auto K3S. Um, kind of my next question is because you use auto K3S, which is part of the ecosystem from Rancher, how does Cube Clipper compare to Rancher, which Although a company started off as a Kubernetes distribution, which in itself has a web UI to manage clusters, create clusters using K3S and other Kubernetes distributions on top of different infrastructure as a service providers. Okay, uh, Rancher, uh, Rancher is uh... It's good, uh, uh, as well as uh, cube clip, uh, cube fail, cube fail, and the rancher is both okay. Uh, they give a beautiful uh, web console and uh, give a solution for the multi cluster management with uh, cube feed or other things. Uh, cube clipper is uh, not uh, uh, focused on the multi cluster uh, management. Uh, 
uh, with the feed or something is not our directly uh, uh, proposed. Okay, we just uh, uh, we just uh, uh, use the KC uh, as uh, auto case reads. We just do this uh, with the KC. You can you can manage management uh, your K Kubernetes cluster. Uh, uh, management uh, your uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, life cycle, and uh, you can uh, use the uh, web console or, or keep, uh, Kubernetes console uh, to say the workload, uh, maybe deployments or something. Uh, you can you can you can say it from from the web console, but uh, uh, we do not. Uh, uh, give you the cube feed or other uh, more advanced uh, feature. We do not do this. Okay. We could focus on uh, the uh, CAS. We focus on CAS, this Kubernetes as a service. Just like uh, uh, you can use uh, uh, AKS, uh, Azure AKS, or the EKS from AWS. Now you can on premise use it. Okay. So let's uh, let's move forward with the presentation. If anyone has any question, please put it in the chat, and uh, we will make sure they you know like they get to the Cube Clever uh, team. Uh, okay, so we have a couple of minutes, so please go ahead with the, your presentation. Yeah, sure. And also uh, the last part, uh, the last part introduced about the roadmap. Uh, we are going to do something. Uh, the first is cluster installation optimization, and uh, it's need to explain a little bit. Now we uh, if if we if we finish the list uh, list feature, we can run KC uh, on the KBS cluster or run it uh, in uh, binary mode. Uh, both okay. Okay, you can continue. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and the uh, the web console. Uh, uh, we will uh, do something about the web console's workload resource monitoring presentation, uh, tenant-based cluster access control, and we'll also add application store uh, and do some application lifecycle management and support web UI client, client interface. And also we will add some common application plugins integra integrations uh, like Low balance and ingress monitoring Kubernetes, the Kubernetes dashboard, Kubage. And uh, finally, we will support KOK clusters. Okay, I'm finished. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we, uh, we 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 hope if we can continue the conversation in the Slack channel. So please do not forget to uh, add your your question back there, and uh, the Cube Clever team can answer. Um, thank you so much, Cube Clever team. Uh, all right. So the next item uh, will be the Wasm Club. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen really quick. You should be able to see a nice little uh, nice little Wasm Cloud graphic. Uh, my name is Brooks Townsend. I've been working on the Wasm Cloud project uh, just after it launched in September or so of 2019. And I'd like to present how Wasm Cloud has grown over the last couple of years of being open source, especially as a CNCF sandbox project, and why we're moving to uh, kick off the move to incubating uh, in the CNCF with growing production use cases. So a brief history of the project, Wasm Cloud came out of an emerging technology group at a large US bank with a couple of core tenants, 
in an organization where thousands of cloud native applications use and reuse the same templates, open source libraries, and common functionality, we see developer productivity grind to a halt whenever there's a vulnerability or a common upgrade that every application team has to make. Wasm Cloud was created out of a desire to pull those common functionalities into what we call capabilities, which can be denied by default and swapped at runtime. So a couple of core tenants that we founded with, we wanted to stop rewriting vulnerable boilerplate, make distributed applications easy and fun, allow you to run applications anywhere that are secure by default. And the if you had to boil it down to one sentence, it's the desire that for developers, you should not have to change your design, your architecture, or your programming environment as you move from concept to production. Wasm Cloud has been open source from the very beginning, accepting all contributions under Apache 2.0 and uh, was donated to the CNCF as the Sandbox project in 2021. So uh, I, I think I missed this right in the beginning of my presentation. I've got the chat open, so please feel free to drop uh, questions. Otherwise, just feel free to interrupt me if you have questions along the way. So at a high level, talking about what the Wasm Cloud project is, it's a WebAssembly application runtime. We run and orchestrate WebAssembly modules, which was originally invented to bring native code to the browser. And that uh, in order to run in the browser and get buy-in from all the different browser vendors needed to satisfy some very core requirements around portability, sandbox security, being polyglot and being very efficient. And those things are all perfect for a server side uh, applications. So in addition to running WebAssembly, we provide interfaces and official capabilities to satisfy cloud native uh, capabilities, things like key value stores, message brokers, HTTP load balancers, things that all kinds of cloud native applications use, whether they know it as a library or are using it explicitly. Um, and all of this, of course, is open source. So in addition to the ones that we provide, community members are welcome to implement their own. As far as our uh, language support, we have our cool core tools and runtime written in Rust because of the sandboxed memory safe capabilities of Rust and its ability to compile to WebAssembly. And we have active SDKs for developers, both in Rust and TinyGo. But with WebAssembly uh, support, there are support for many different languages. And we'll talk about where that comes in for Wasm Cloud here in a moment when we talk about standards. Additionally, in terms of deploying Wasm Cloud, it's just a binary. We distribute a single binary that, uh, or different binaries for Linux, Mac, Windows, uh, that runs on the x86 and ARM64 architectures. So because it's just a binary and not dependent on a specific architecture, it can also run within or outside of containers or Kubernetes. It can run on bare metal, small IoT devices, et cetera. So we've taken the stance to be compatible with all those things in cloud native, but people have many different requirements. And so running outside of them is just as important. From the beginning, Wasm Cloud has been a cloud native project. Not only was it designed to bring WebAssembly to the server side, We've also been able to leverage the vast wealth of open standards that exist in the cloud native ecosystem. We use the OCI distribution and image spec in order to distribute our WebAssembly modules and OCI repositories. We use the open application model spec in order to define our declarative application manifest for a really familiar way of creating a deployment. All of the common and important events that happen in our system, we publish out as a cloud event format for easy ingestion with other tools. The entire runtime is instrumented with open telemetry, both for the developer side and the user of Wasm Cloud. All you need to do is point it to an OTLP exporter and you'll see distributed traces no matter where your actual Wasm Cloud runtimes are running. And we use the NATS, the CNCF incubating project NATS, uh, in order to create our networking layer, we call a lattice. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but we use that for our distributed message passing and uh, the interactions with Wasm Cloud. 
Additionally, each release that we create of Wasm Cloud, not only do we publish that binary for the different architectures and operating systems, we also publish a container, we push it up to Docker Hub, and then we distribute a Helm chart as well so that people who are trying it out for the first time or people who use Kubernetes regularly can just simply apply a Helm chart to their cluster and get started with running a WebAssembly. I'd like to talk just a little bit more about the Lattice network that we have with NATS. And uh, the reason why is because WebAssembly has the potential to run on any architecture operating system, even in a web browser. And with that portability only really matters if you are able to actually extend your network to be able to access those WebAssembly modules. And that's a big part of what we do with Wasm Cloud. The Lattice network allows all these different services, which is kind of analogous to like a container running in Kubernetes, a WebAssembly module running inside of Wasm Cloud. They allow you to queue subscribe on topics which are not IP address based or service name based. So it's very transparent to the user, but this means that developers themselves don't deal with the actual networking layer of running a distributed system. They can focus on the pure logic of their application and they don't have to design their application for high availability or edge compatibility. You can just simply scale up to those locations. Another very important thing in Wasm Cloud is the development of WebAssembly standards. We align with and look to implement and contribute to all of the latest WebAssembly standards that come out of the W3C, which is the standards body that drives the technology specification. And we also contribute very heavily and align with the Bytecode Alliance, which is a foundation composed of many different industry leaders in the WebAssembly organization across a broad range of industries, especially for SDKs and implementations. Under the hood, there are many different WebAssembly engines that you can choose to actually run the WebAssembly format, but we use the WasmTime engine, which comes out of the Bytecode Alliance and is most backed by standards. Over the last few years, we've used the Smithy uh, interface definition language, which is actually an open source language that comes out of Amazon. It's how they describe their services in AWS. And over the next few months, we'll be transitioning uh, from the Smithy interfaces to WIT, which is WebAssembly interface types. It's what everyone in the WebAssembly standards uh, land will use to define cloud native interfaces. The things like a simple key value store, may provide the operations to get a key, set a key, uh, do a list of keys, things like that. We're also rapidly prototyping for the release of WASI Preview 2, which you may or may not have seen recently, very big in the cloud native land that Go added support for most of WASI Preview 1. These are just different phases in the WebAssembly uh, standard space on the server side. And what comes with the WASI Preview 2 interface is the language support that we've always dreamed of in the proposal for WebAssembly components. This essentially gives you a way to stitch together uh, WebAssembly modules that could be in any source language. At the end of the day, it just ends up being a WebAssembly module. So we can actually write all of our core SDKs and interaction models in Rust, compile them to a WebAssembly module, and then users can take their business logic, the code that they wrote in whatever source language, and we can combine them together to be a fully featured WebAssembly module that will run and work with Wasm Cloud or any other uh, CNCF um, uh, standards conforming WebAssembly runtime. So the current way that this works is essentially you have the user code bundled together with our SDK. And in the future, with components, we'll be able to distribute our SDK and the interface types individually. And the user code will be a completely, uh, it'll just be business logic that you can take off the shelf and put it and run it. I'd like to talk a little bit about the community and our adopters. We have our homepage at wasmcloud.com and an open community Slack at slack.wasmcloud.com. That is also linked at the bottom of our website. We run weekly community meetings Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, which we also live stream to YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, and LinkedIn, basically all over the place so we can meet people wherever they prefer to watch their live streams. And anybody, of course, is welcome in the Zoom. We put together the agenda ahead of time, and anyone is welcome to uh, define topics, talk about things that they would be interested in in the Wasm Cloud ecosystem. 
We've also been accepting recently, uh, we've been asking companies to add themselves to our adopters list, which we can see we have met at least three for the incubating tier. And uh, that list is rapidly growing as we get people to define their use cases and get through the, the POC phase. Additionally, we've seen really steady growth that's rapidly increased this year as the uh, general hype cycle around WebAssembly is improving. At, at every conference that we go to, the amount of people that have heard of WebAssembly before or are starting to use it goes up and up, and we can see that reflected in the people who contribute and commit to the project. Additionally, we have a very wide range of companies that actually contribute to and use Wasm Cloud. This is another view from the dev stats on the CNCF instance of just different companies and developers at that company, at those companies that contribute to Wasm Cloud, which is very valuable getting the perspective from different industries. This ranges from uh, power companies to banks to uh, you know, other financial institutions, uh, telco, et cetera. I'd love to just kind of wrap this up a little bit with a small demo to show you like what it looks like to run Wasm Cloud in action. And I'm gonna start with a pretty simple idea of a microservice, but I wanna take you through one of our favorite journeys, which we call the uh, napkin to production uh, sketch. So you're at a happy hour or something after a conference, you come up with an idea for an application, something like, very simple microservice, a key value counter that accepts, except it accepts HTTP requests and increments of value in a key value store. This is something that this, this architecture diagram you may sketch out on the back of a napkin. You take it home, you stuff it in your pocket, and the next day you get to work on it. And I want to show you with Wasm Cloud how you can make this into a real application and then the possibilities that you get from there. So we have our idea for our key value counter. And what this is is just a simple service that takes HTTP requests. This is kind of broken out into the notion of capabilities and functional logic in actors, and then stores things in a key value store. When you're writing this out, you may not think of a vendor right away, like whether or not you're going to use Redis or a different key value store or a specific HTTP server. And that's intentional. This should be dictated by the capability that you need and not the specific requirements that you have at runtime. So I'd like to just start by showing you the code for this application, just to give you an idea of what it means to code with capabilities. If I can close this side, actually, that'd be great. So this, uh, this WebAssembly module is written in Rust, compiled to WebAssembly. If you haven't looked at Rust before, uh, this should actually still be easy to grok. The way that you develop when you use Wasm Cloud is in terms of these common capability contracts. So when we talk about the ability to be an HTTP server, we have a very generic representation in this one handler that you have to implement. It is a function that takes an HTTP request and returns an HTTP response. This will look pretty familiar if you've used a function as a service or like a serverless style uh, SDK before, because it's very like on invocation, but this extends to everything that you do with Wasm Cloud. Now, in response to an HTTP request, I do a couple of different things. One of them uh, is for a small static UI, which you'll see in a moment, which is very critical to the demo. But the core piece of the logic here is taking the key that we've sent with the HTTP request using a key value sender, which is a generic representation of a key value store, and incrementing the value at that key, and then returning the response as JSON. Very simple logic. The entire piece that makes up this small microservice is about 50 lines of code, including a little bit of breaking out into a function and all of that. But what you'll notice here is there's no notion of how you're receiving that HTTP request, any logic about doing load balancing, any specific vendor or SDK that you're using for a key value store. All of that are requirements that you can fulfill at runtime. So if we take a look at deploying this application, there are a couple of different pieces. There's the key value counter WebAssembly module or the actor. And I can start that directly from our, uh, our Azure container registry. This is not a container, it's just a WebAssembly module, but we're using the OCI spec to store it there. And then we need two capabilities. In order to make this work, we need to fulfill the HTTP server and the key value store. 
So I can use the Wasm Cloud HTTP server. It's just a simple implementation using Rust that opens up a listener on a local port uh, by default 8080. And then I can also start the key value Redis capability provider. And so this is actually the point at runtime where I get to decide to connect my key value counter to Redis as an implementation. You could also use our implementation for HashiCorp Vault if you're dealing with secrets. A community member actually contributed the capability provider for uh, AWS DynamoDB, which kind of takes a document storage and fits it to the key value contract. In the end of the day, there's, there's a lot of exciting things you can do when you get to choose this at runtime. So actually taking a look at the application itself. Oh, did I miss it? Let me make sure that opened up. I think I might just need to actually open up that port. So we can, the way that you end up uh, providing configuration at runtime is by giving this, uh, what we call a link. So you connect the key value counter microservice to the HTTP server. And we'll have it listen on 8081 instead of 8080. So as you can see, the UI is very critical to this. Uh, it's how we're popping off fireworks whenever we increment that value in a key value store. Uh, but the microservice itself is, is very simple. Um, you can enter in a bucket name if you wanted to store it at a different counter, all, all of that fun stuff. So the logic that I showed you, other than just bundling in the static assets, that's all that you needed in order to make this work. There's no notion of how you get the HTTP request. And the flexibility that that gives is it allows you to write this and test it locally on your machine. And then when you deploy it to production, you can hook it up to production level services and your logic is all the same. And because it's WebAssembly, it's just the one single binary that I can run locally on my Mac versus in production, which is probably Linux. Maybe you work at a company that uses Windows containers, doesn't matter because it's just WebAssembly. Now I wanna talk just a little bit about the flexibility of this application and how Wasm Cloud works with the Lattice, the networking layer. So I have this one Wasm Cloud runtime that's on my Mac here in New York. I'm actually at a conference today, so I'm not, uh, not at home, but I also have a couple of other hosts connected. One that's connected directly is actually running on a Raspberry Pi back at my condo in Washington, DC. And because the networking layer is connected, it's all the same whether you run additional instances of a service, additional instances of a capability, things like that. So from the exact same OCI reference, there's no different notion of architectures here. It's just a WebAssembly module, so it's platform agnostic. We can start another instance of our key value counter back at my uh, back on the Raspberry Pi at my house in DC. And then I'm having trouble clicking on that. We can click increment. This is actually gonna do uh, essentially a round robin back and forth between the two services that's built into Wasm Cloud. And just to prove to you that we have that different scalability, I can actually go back to the host that's running locally on my machine and I can remove that key value counter entirely. Now, the only one left is the one running on my Raspberry Pi back in DC. We can hit increment and it'll increment as normal now all of those requests, when I hit my local host endpoint, get routed to the Raspberry Pi in DC and then back to the Redis instance on my local machine. So we have this automatic failover and load balancing built into Wasm Cloud. So that's all stuff that you get with the runtime. I wanted to make sure to show off the practical use of this application architecture uh, in the demo because I think it's really key to see the flexibility that you can have when you build your applications in this way. And that's why we're taking Wasm Cloud from Sandbox and applying for incubation. So thank you, everyone. I have, I think I've got some time here at the end to answer any questions or happy to dive into more, more things there. Uh, one question uh, when you were showing the code, uh, you were showing the code of the actor, right? So the, so there was a part of the, an HTTP server on the actor, or did, there's just a reference to an HTTP server? Yeah, great question. So this is just the code for the actor, and this is what developers would write. And it's essentially implementing one side of the contract, the receiver of the HTTP request. So this is the part that you need to implement on the development side. 
Now, on the other side of this, the other side of the contract is essentially setting up the listener and then forwarding the request to the actor. And if you'd like to see uh, the actual implementation that I used here in the Wasm Cloud repo, we have the HTTP server. And I'll try to find the exact piece in the code, but essentially what it boils down to is when you start the actor in the Wasm Cloud network, we set up a real HTTP server, listen for those requests, and then can forward it on to the actor. I can send this in the chat. Oh, okay, well. you got it. You got it. All right. Yeah. So this loose coupling Thanks. is intentional. It's both for the uh, making it simple to develop the application in the first place. You don't have to worry about spinning up your own HTTP server. Um, and from a security perspective and vulnerability perspective, most of the times applications end up using the same libraries like this HTTP server library anyways. And what it means for big companies that run this or multiple different teams that have the same HTTP server is that they can use the one entity instead of all needing to update their application if there's a vulnerability in that open source SDK. So that, so that means you just have to update a single entity instead of updating multiple entities uh, when you find a vulnerability? That's right. So essentially here in the Wasm Cloud land, I could have many different WebAssembly modules, like Echo is another one that we have as an application that links to the HTTP server. All of them can de depend on the same, essentially, implementation. And if there's a vulnerability, it's just the responsibility of the developer to go from you know 17 to 17.1 everything automatically relinks together at runtime, the configuration stays the same. And so applications don't have to actually change their logic in order for that to work. Got it, got it. Thanks, we got a couple of questions. So. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Brooks, really excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to ask you about the management of, as I understand, they're called leaf nodes. And so um, I see from your documentation that you have a Kubernetes integration, um, but Kubernetes, any other orchestration framework, I understand that Wasm Cloud is a single binary that you, you kind of run this and you attach it and it becomes kind of almost like a me you know, mesh network. How do you accommodate for orchestration frameworks that are now orchestrating an orchestration framework in itself? Um, here we're, using a high level orchestration framework such as Kubernetes to handle, which is essentially a WASM node, right? Um, how do you, uh, and this is, it's very loosely, loose this question. I was, I was trying to understand how, how you accommodate for trying to integrate observability from the highest level orchestration framework um, where you would be as a, say as a DevOps engineer, SRE, trying to understand the workload of individual, and this would be, you know, this is, this is microservices, this is functions of service, how to accommodate for trying to understand that maybe a particular uh, service within Wasm Cloud on your larger orchestration framework is, for example, being, uh, you know, it, it, it's timing out, it, it's having an issue, it, it, it's using too much resources. Um, how, how, do you, how does Wasm Cloud, um, integrate with these services? Do you have any, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, what, what's, that, what's the kind of the thought process here? What's the roadmap look like? Yeah, that's a, that's a very nuanced question. I think there's a lot to unpack there around uh, Wasm Cloud and what and Sorry what about do. that. <laughs> no, 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 it's, um, it's really exciting. So I, I, I wanna focus on Wasm Cloud itself. And so I can definitely come back to NATS and kind of the networking strategy there, but I'll focus on the orchestration piece. So one of the reasons why it was so important for us to not depend on an orchestration framework and to just be kind of a base level runtime is because people use orchestration methods that are not just running in Kubernetes. Um, I work for the company Cosmonic. We actually use HashiCorp Nomad to schedule different Wasm Cloud uh, nodes. You can essentially think of Wasm Cloud analogous to a container runtime where you know, the orchestrator that you get to pick is, is on top of that. This was one of the reasons why we decided to go with open telemetry from the start. And the fact that these uh, invocations that run through the system, the HTTP requests that I do that routes out to my Raspberry Pi and back, 
that distributed trace can be very difficult to follow, especially if you're hitting a variety of different architectures. So being able to have that trace to watch a single invocation flow through the system, whether you're running in Kubernetes or on an edge device, is really important. When it comes down to resource allocation, spinning up more WebAssembly modules, that's essentially left up to the uh, load balance or the, the auto scaling of the orchestrator that you're using. If you're running into memory pressure, you can always run additional Wasm Cloud runtimes for like a horizontal scale, or you can run additional individual actors to handle the request that's getting hit uh, the most frequently. So I want to pause there because I know that there were a couple of things. Is that kind of getting in the direction that you're talking about around observability, hitting the uh, different services in a Wasm Cloud uh, lattice? Absolutely. Yeah, that definitely answers my question. Thank you. OK, great. Um, I'm happy to talk about uh, NATs, leaf nodes, and things as well. Um, but I know we're a little short on time. So David, I, I definitely want to get to your question. Thanks, Mark. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, I love the uh, the actors and the uh, not them to be distributed without actually having talking directly. Um, what are you What are your thoughts on the uh, standardization work going on for uh, interfaces for like say key values and HTTP? Um, I, I think that world is a great future. Uh, I'm wondering where Wasm Cloud kind of thinks about that. Yeah, so we've been using interfaces as a core method for our actors and our capabilities to talk to each other, uh, essentially for the entire time that Wasm Cloud has existed. I think that around the standardization of interfaces, there's some really exciting work going on there. Some of it is easy. Things like HTTP servers take an HTTP request and return an HTTP response. And that's going to cover like the vast majority of that use case. Things like key value stores or SQL stores are certainly more difficult. The capabilities get much more nuanced at that point. And so for Wasm Cloud and, and essentially what we're trying to work with the uh, Bycode Alliance and the people driving the, it's called the WASI Cloud effort, just common capabilities for applications in WebAssembly, is effectively trying to reach the 85 or 95 or 90% 85 or use case. So a simple abstraction of a key value store, a simpler and, and common abstraction of things like a message broker around publishing, making a request for a message. But then the ability to be able to define and bring your own interfaces is really important. Um, Wasm Cloud has supported that from the beginning. The convention for contracts that we provide is something we provide as a guide. But if you... And this is the example I always use. Uh, I don't even know if this is a valid version number. If you need a really specific thing from like Postgres 8 or Postgres 8.1, and it doesn't fit within the interface, that's why it's really important to be able to define your own. As, as much as abstractions are nice for flexibility, sometimes at the end of the day, you need a very specific feature of a vendor. So really, my thoughts are that the standards effort is really important for creating something that people can build many different abstractions on. But being able to define your own interfaces is just as important for that. Uh, yeah, Quentin. Yeah, sorry, I, I think we're running out of time. So I'll be very brief. But uh, it uh, struck me uh, that a lot of what you've done is is kind of independent of WASM. And you, one could imagine uh doing something similar with other runtimes uh i mean i think this stuff is super valuable and and i would love to see the same thinking and the same source of implementation uh be used in other environments than wasm not that i have anything against wasm H have you given any thought to that uh you know I, I hazard to even mention the other potential runtimes but there there are several of them that i'm sure are pretty obvious you know, it's funny because, and, and this is why I always start the presentation or with Wasm Cloud talking about why we started the project, like the core tenants, is because none of it is WebAssembly specific. Um, the actual initial idea for the project came out of something called Cloud ABI, which essentially, if you go look at their repo, it says, hey, go look at WebAssembly stand systems interface. That's what we're like, the, the spirit of the project lives on in them. Um, so you're, you're right. The, there's a lot of core... Uh, the, the core tenants that we have are not WebAssembly specific, um, and our core focus is to make the developer's life better, more easier, fun, and really just get us down to doing what we like doing, which is just writing code. I think that that kind of, 
this is going to be a strong word, transcends just using a single technology. Um, and I think that some of these principles would be great in, in other domains as well. Awesome. That's good news. Thank you. All right, so we have one more minute. Uh, any questions? Amazing. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much for the Cloud team. Uh, and hopefully if we can continue the discussion, yeah. either in background time, uh, Slack channel, or WASM working group, uh, Slack channel. Um, and yeah, um, if no questions, so I believe uh, we can end this meeting. Um, thank you all, and uh, see you next time. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. Bye.